There have been many World War II movies, but only a few are truly great. And of the greats, there seems to be an inordinate number of classics revolving around prisoners of war, implacable jailers versus irrepressible inmates, stiff upper lips, triumph of the human spirit, and often downbeat endings and all of that. And one of the very greatest of the great, and not just because it's got the word great in the title, is The Great Escape. I'm not someone who enjoys prison dramas at all, but POW stories seem to be a different kettle of fish altogether. Though, upon reflection, why you'd want to store fish in a kettle seems counterproductive, unless you want every single cup of tea to smell like cod. Tea. There's something about World War II POW movies that, despite having the main characters cooped up like battery pheasants, they often still manage to retain a sense of adventure with their battles of wills and ingenuity in the face of overwhelming odds. Films like Starleg 17, Bridge on the River Kwai, Von Ryan's Express all managed to tell their stories in an entertaining way that mixed triumph and failure. Like finishing fourth place at the Olympics, yet you still win the gold medal because the top three all failed drug tests. One of the greatest POW films, greatest war movies, and in fact greatest movie of all time is John Sturgis's 1963 film, The Great Escape. I have had the pleasure of knowing quite a number of British officers in this war. And I flatter myself that we understand one another. Sturgis was a prolific director happy to work in different genres, but is often remembered for action movies, such as his westerns Gunfight at the OK Corral and The Magnificent Seven, the latter of which became a classic, but wasn't a smash hit in the US on release. Former POW Paul Brickhill's 1950 book detailing the actual mass escape of Allied POWs from Starlek Luft III in 1944 had already formed the basis of a live TV play in the 50s, but when the Mirish Company and John Sturgis came on board, a movie telling of the escape was sure to be a big thing. Why didn't anybody think of that before? The Great Escape details a group departure from a new German POW camp run by the Luftwaffe. Starlag Luft 3 is meant to hold all of the serial escapees and was designed to be escape-proof, or as escape-proof as you could be without cementing people's feet into the floor. The movie starts off with new inmates arriving and immediately testing camp security before planning for some sort of mass exodus, large egress, gigantic evacuation of some 250 men from the camp. If you escape again and be caught, you will be shot. Big X, the master escape artist, outlines a daring plan to dig three tunnels to freedom. We'll call them Tom, Dick and Harry. With civilian clothes and faked documentation manufactured for hundreds of would-be jailbreakers. The Germans are ever efficient and vigilant, discovering one of the tunnels, getting up early to put their towels on the deck chairs near the swimming pool, and constantly marching off recaptured escapees to the cooler, the camp's solitary confinement barracks. And you? Shower. I need a wash. I'm watching him. I'm a lifeguard. We see the meticulous planning for the breakout, transforming service uniforms into natty civilian leisure wear, scrounging of supplies from the weaker German guards, forging German documents, digging the tunnels big enough to hold 250 men with their luggage and still allow for adequate duty-free shopping. There's the tension of the big event that of course goes wrong with only 76 leaving on the night. We're 20 feet short. How the hell are you? 20 feet short. Now Hilt is on the other end of that rope in the woods. As soon as you feel a couple of tugs, off you go, but you'll have to keep Colin low on the way across. And then finally, watching as most of the heroes are recaptured fairly quickly with 50 escapees murdered. Three men are shown to escape. Not shown what actually happened to POW escapees when they reached Spain, which seems to be overlooked in movies. But according to accounts from P.R. Reid, who had escaped from Kolditz, a Spanish holiday on your way home from a German prisoner of war camp was not the five-star all-inclusive package holiday deal you'd expect. No. Yes. The movie starts with a caption saying how real events have been compressed and characters turned into composites of real people, and that the film is basically what actually happened, apart from the fact that the characters are composites and the time has been compressed. Actually, we should be quite thankful that it was squashed down, as the movie, with its three-hour runtime, does manage to positively fly by, unlike the airmen interned in the camp. The Great Escape brought together several big names and up-and-coming actors, along with three of the stars of The Magnificent Seven. I wouldn't do that for my own mother. <laughs> I don't blame you. Well, okay, then. Well, I mean, it's completely understandable. Well, okay, then. 
most of the characters are given a story function. Richard Attenborough stars as Roger, the big X, which is a fancy way of saying escape mastermind. He's almost obsessed with giving the Germans a black eye by having to tie up thousands of Germans in searching for several hundred escapees roaming the German countryside. Even if none of them get home, they at least frustrate the German war effort, eh, a little bit. We're not blitzing out two or three or a dozen, but 200, 300, scatter them all over Germany. Do you think that's possible? Well, the men are here to do it. The goons have put every escape artist in Germany in this camp. You say so yourself. Think of Roger as the guy who talks you into buying a defective car, just so you might crash it, so he can then sue the maker. Scrounger. Cooler King Virgil Hiltz, so named, not because he's a great escapee, but because he's a fairly so-so escapee, in a role that allows Steve McQueen to do what he does best, say very little and be cool. Having a look around the camp, it's clear that the cooler is not the worst place to be. It's private and has its own ensuite. Well, it's a bucket. It's the only place in the camp where you can have a bit of me time. Unless, of course, you're in the cell next to Hilts. Give it a rest with the bloody ball. I'm trying to take a dump. And as you would expect with someone called the Cooler King, Hiltz, having failed so many escape attempts, spends an awful lot of time there. Well, like I told Max, I was trying to cut my way through your wire because I want to get out. Unlike all of the other escapees, Hilt's plan after leaving the compound doesn't involve fake civilian clobber and forged documents. His plan seems to revolve around trying to decapitate a German soldier to steal his wheels. He's all balls and no brains. Well, we sneak out at night to a spot I found near the wire, a blind spot. Then we dig straight down, three feet, take the dirt, spread it on top so it won't make a pile, and then straight out. McQueen became the undisputed breakout star of the film as the coolest simpleton around. How do you breathe? Well, we got a steel rod with hinges on it, and we shove it up and make air holes as we go along. Good night, sir. Other stars, or later to be stars, appear. Gordon Jackson as MacDonald, the intelligence officer. Your job is very good. Well, thanks, Mac. I've put in a lot of... Oh, now watch it, Haynes. It's the easiest way in the world to trip up a suspect. Don't fall for that old guy. David McCallum, whose main job seems to be getting rid of tunnel dirt. Wearing them inside your trousers. Donald Pleasance, the master forger, who's also blind as a bat. I can see perfectly. Perfectly. Charles Bronson is a Polish airman who digs the tunnels, but he's also claustrophobic, so he's a bit like a dentist scared of getting a filling. You dug 17 tunnels, over 17 because tunnels. Because I must get out. I hide the fear and I dig. James Coburn is an Australian who manufactures things, like his accent. What are you doing with my coat, mate? If you can speak English, I understand. Bloody good. James Garner probably has the character with the most range. Henley is the scrounger who can charmingly blackmail German guards into getting impossible things that they need for the escape. There is one small favor. A camera. We want to take some snapshots, you know. 35 millimeter with 2.8 lens and a plane shutter. But he also agrees to take the blind forger Blythe with him. And you can see how he almost immediately regrets this decision. He knows he's not going to get home now, but he presses on. Colin's not a blind man as long as he's with me. And he's going with me. Despite this being a World War II movie made in the 1960s, there's no sign of, up. Oh, no, there he is. Your drum is good. So in the actual camp, while there were Americans involved in the build-up to the escape, they were transferred to a different camp before the actual escape, which was basically British and Commonwealth soldiers. But a Hollywood movie without Hollywood movie stars is basically a TV movie filmed in Canada. In 1963, the fact was Steve McQueen put more bums on seats than Dickie Attenborough. Oh, it's shattering. Also, to rub salt into the wounds, the American stars all play characters who make it through to the end of the movie. Are all American officers so ill-mannered? Yeah, about 99%. It's not a film about great successes. Even the film's most iconic moment, when Steve McQueen's character attempts to jump a motorcycle over a border, ends in failure, but you don't think any less of the characters for the attempt. It's a testament to the film's all-round greatness that even after the tenth viewing, you're still hoping they'll make it this one time. Jesus, I really need to stop betting on the outcome of this film. That's eight times on the trot. The Great Escape is a wonderful film. It has tension, stoicism, emotion and action, and is one of the best films of the decade. It's staged, photographed and acted beautifully. But of course, one element that really became iconic was the score by composer Elmer Bernstein, where he created one of the most memorable movie themes ever.
Of course, it's easy to look at the film now at home on your sofa and yell at the characters for not simply overpowering the guards with kung fu, kidnapping the commandant at knife point and using parkour skills to bounce the hell out of there before heading back to England on a cloud. Uh, but then again, just how much is too much gin before breakfast? Good luck to us, Danny. Richard Attenborough would go on to become a director where he directed large-scale epics like A Bridge Too Far and Gandhi, for which he won an Academy Award as Best Director. But screw that, he was in Jurassic Park. David McCallum would eventually work for his uncle, and a decade later got banged up in another escape-proof German POW camp in Kolditz, and then later on appeared in NCIS. Gordon Jackson, later to appear in Upstairs, Downstairs and The Professionals. Good luck. Thank you. James Garner would appear in many films and later starred in the phenomenally successful series The Rockford Files. Donald Pleasant spent a career creeping people out. Steve McQueen was the definition of cool for the rest of his life. Charles Bronson carved out a niche for himself as anti-hero vigilante types. And James Coburn's career was a mix of tough guy and light comedy roles, like a rock. The Great Escape is a film that you will see references to in unusual places, like a Quentin Tarantino movie. 10 days isolation hills. Captain Hills. It's so stupid, it's positively brilliant. The Great Escape is one of those supremely watchable and re-watchable films. An all-star cast, great script and excellent direction. It's the sort of thing that you marvel at the detail involved in putting together a story like this. I think it's rather good. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. Leave a comment below or check out some of our other videos. I hate your hills.